Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Reading Roundtable of January uh, 2021, thank God. The 21st of January 2021. And this is uh, Greed Literatura's was becoming our monthly Reading Roundtable. And this one um, is uh, on healing in the midst of crisis. This is the third in the series, uh, our third reading roundtable and third in the series that we're doing on crisis poetry. Um, the uh, first one was in October uh, on uh, crisis poetry as poetry of witness. Um, the uh, second was last month on joy in the midst of crisis. Uh, and then our final one uh, will be next month. Our fourth and final one will be on um, hope, um, but more than hope in the midst of crisis, like building a future out of crisis. Uh, so that should be a very interesting one. Then we hope that we're going to continue uh, with other topics on a monthly basis with this whole concept of a reading roundtable. The concept of reading roundtable is that um, we are going to do some reading uh, and we're going to be doing um, this. We're basically going to be digging into the text and stuff. Um, for these dis uh, these discussions, we've uh, um, been talking about an expanded sense of crisis, both personal and societal. So oftentimes like personal crisis is reflective of, uh, pers of um, persistent uh, um, of traumas that have been faced in communities. Some of those immediate uh, like war or famine or plague or some of those more uh, persistent long-term and systemic um, like uh, uh, racism, homophobia, uh, um, et cetera. Uh, so for this one, um, we we're looking at uh, healing. Aspects of he people say that art is very healing. So how is that? Um, how can poetry serve uh, both the artist and the community or the world at large to heal. Um, and then what is our role as uh, poets? How can we as people um, all, who are also in crisis with community as well, um, create, uh, create works that help heal the community and also find the space for ourselves to heal ourselves in order to create uh, that work. Um, we were gonna do this in November, <laughs> but at that point we all decided, um, it was Joe and Lisa and I at that time, and we decided, you know, I think we're gonna be too exhausted in November. We should push this off to January. I think we'll be really well rested then by January. Um, yeah, <laughs> and here we are the day after <laughs> the inauguration, um, and, uh, I literally after at least one of the crises has, uh, subsided, and I don't know about you, but, um, it wasn't until noon yesterday that um, I had realized how much I'd physically been carrying all this time, certainly over the last year, two years, all the last four to five years, um, that it, it felt like suddenly my spine could unlatch and unlock and, and breathe, like I'd been carrying, locked into my, into my very bones, uh, grief, all this grief, um, yeah, that was an interesting experience. So here we are. Um, I would like to introduce our panel uh, for this evening. Joe Davis uh, 
is um, a nationally touring artist, educator, and speaker based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He employs poetry, music, theater, and dance to shape culture. His work has been featured on BET, CNN, and VH1. He is the founder and director of the multimedia production company, The New Renaissance, the front man of an emerging soul funk band, The Poetic Diaspora, who really tear it up um, if you ever get a chance to see them. Yeah, holy crap. Um, and the co-creator of Just Move, Racial Justice Education Through Art. He has keynoted, facilitated conversation and served as a teaching artist at hundreds of high schools and universities, including New York, Boston, and most recently as artist in residence at Luther Seminary, where he earned a master's in theology of the arts. Uh, visit joedavispoetry.com for looking for inquiries to connect and bookings and learn more. Um, Lisa Marie Bremer uh, is a poet, essayist, and uh, theater artist born on Ho-Chunk Sock, Miami, Meskwaki land, living now in Minnesota, Makat, is that Makachi? Makatse, I didn't ask that, sorry. Minnesota Makoche. Okay, Makoche. In so-called Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, in uh, 2020, their work appeared in Gasher Journal, the Public Art Review, and La Raza uh, Kamika, and is forthcoming uh, from Denver's literary mag, The BK. In 2019, uh, Bremer co uh, edited the anthology Queer Voices, Poetry, Prose, and Pride, and they now co uh, curate the Queer Voices reading series along with Sherry Fernandez Williams. Um, awesome person. And uh, they are also the member of Free Black Dirt an educator at Century College and freelance facilitator consultant. Thela Sitlali Gomez uh, is an East LA Inland Empire transplant who uh, writes to piece together broken stories of family trauma and healing and travel a la Southern California. Thalia is a 2015 uh, winner of the Lock Literary Center's Mentor Series in Creative Nonfiction, a 2017 Beyond the Pure Fellow uh, through Intermedia Arts, and a 2020 Fellow of the Lock Literary Center's Mirrors and Windows program. Her essay, It Happened in Fragments, can be found in How Dare We Write, um, due to uh, everything that 2020 and 2021 have brought us so far, um, including limiting the number of trips to the market. <laughs> she has revisited the art of making tortillas at home oh. <laughs> um, with her own hands, a pinch of salt, and a lot of prayers. Finally, uh, Paul Shevsky. For her fourth poetry uh, collection, Quitter, won the Diode Editions Book Prize. She is also the author of The Threatened Everything, Ghost Fargo, uh, which um, was a Night Boat uh, Poetry Prize winner, um, Upon Arrival, and several chapbooks, including the lyric prose Misplaced Sinister, which is about labyrinths and really awesomely cool. And I think out of print, so. But you can check with her. Um, her poems have been feature, featured on Verse Daily and included in the recent and forthcoming anthologies, uh, Privacy Policy, the anthology of surveillance po poetics, 78, a tarot uh, anthology, Rocked by the Waters, Poems of Motherhood, uh, Rewilding, Poems for the Environment, and New Poetry from the Midwest. 
She teaches writing privately and academically, makes things, and collaborates with fellow artists and activists. And thank you. Welcome to all of you. Um, I think as we, before we start, or as we start, um, we're going to go through, since we're talking about healing and such, we're going to go through a grounding exercise that Joe Davis is going to lead us on. Yeah, thanks so much, David. Um, just grateful to be present with you all here today. And uh, in that spirit of presence, I just want to invite everyone in this space right now to do whatever you need to do to, to be present in this space. I know we already have some candles lit, right? Some folks are lighting candles or incense or just clearing the space and getting yourself in a comfortable position where you can be grounded and centered. I just want to take um, some deep breaths with you. But uh, before we do that, as, as you're, you know, clearing your space, as you're settling in, I want to invite you all to just name ancestors that are near and dear to your heart, whether those are people who have impacted and influenced you. I invite you to type those in the, in the chat and just, just speak out those names, just write those names, whether those are ancestors that have impacted you, or whether those are friends and family members, um, chosen friends and family members, as well as, as blood relatives. Um, right, but I just invite you to type those in the chat. Just speak those out. Just as we continue to, you know, find ways to ground and center ourselves. I want to honor, honor those bodies, honor this this space that we're in right now. So I invite that practice. Just for I'll give you a moment to write that. I think it's really important, especially for me. Um, in particular to um, just honor those who have gone on before us, right? They're part of the reason why we're even here today. So I think it's important to honor them. I see a few names in the chat. It's Amelia Brown, Bernice Hinden, have naming grandparents, Louis or Louise, yeah, Colleen, Daniel, Matthew, Grandma, yeah, shout out to Grandma and and Myrtle. Yeah, Grandma Myrtle. Much love, much love. Yeah, well, let's take a moment. Feel free to to continue to, if, if a name comes to you, to write it in the chat or to speak it out, speak it aloud. Um, but I just want to invite you, um, as you're comfortable and as you're able, to just, just rest your body and, and allow gravity to do what gravity does, right? And just feel the weight of gravity on your pulling your body down and just become conscious and aware of your feet, of how whatever part of your body is touching the floor or your chair. And I invite you, if you're comfortable and able to, to close your eyes or to soften your gaze. And we're just gonna spend some time with our bodies. How often do you give yourself the space and time to be with your bodies, right? I just want, want to give you the opportunity right now. Let's just take deep breaths together, three deep breaths. Let them be the three deepest breaths of the day. But let's breathe in deep. Let it flow deep down to your belly and breathe out. Let's take another deep breath and see how deep you can get that air in. Just be grateful for that oxygen. Breathe in deep. Breathe out. And there's no right or wrong way to do this, y'all. Just be conscious of that breath. Be thankful for that breath and for your body. Let's breathe in one more time together. Breathe out. Just want you to take a moment with me and, and just sit in the gratitude of being present. Sit, sit in the gratitude of your body doing everything that your body can do to keep you alive, to care for you. Just, just take a moment, just one moment to sit in that gratitude, y'all. Thank you. I invite you to, 
as you feel comfortable and able to, to bring your attention back to the space. Um, and as, as we talk about healing, right, um, just being present in my body and finding whatever ways I can do to do that have been incredibly powerful and incredibly healing for me. I don't always uh, make the time to do that, but when I do, it's, it's really beautiful and really powerful. So I'm grateful to be able to guide you all and lead you all that in that tonight. I'll turn it back over to David, unless you wanted me to kind of, you know, keep talking or I can, you know, this is well, a conversation, gonna, so we're all talking together. <laughs> I was going to ask you, Joe, since uh, um, we've gone through that, uh, you you said that you do that for, um, okay, first I should say that uh, Joe um, uh, is part of an organization. I think you... Am I right to say that you started it or, or one of the co-founders of it? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah I'm one of the co-founders. Uh, H cubed. Mm -hmm. um, H cubed uh, stands for uh, Harrison Healing and Harmony. And I'm actually just going to share my screen really briefly um, so that you guys can see. What I'm talking about. This is H cubed. Yeah. Um, this is some private chat that I need to close. So um, <laughs> hit the little X, the little X in the corner. <laughs> yeah, I can't see it. So I got too many other windows in the way. Oh, that. Anyway, um, this is uh, this is H cubed, and. It is, uh, if I read the little brief uh, description here, um, this is uh, come join an in intentional community centered open mic and healing space where we will share art, poetry, music, and conversation around issues impacting the Harrison neighborhood in North Minneapolis. Um, and I'm actually going to share the, uh, the link. And is that okay if I do that? Absolutely, yeah, please share it with folks. It's, it's okay. in the public, is out there, yeah. Cool, I'm gonna do that in the chat. So um, can uh, can you tell us about uh, um, HQ's uh, mission? Yeah, yeah, I would love to. Yeah, so so HQ, that's, that's three H's, um, Harrison Healing Harmony. And uh, we've actually since, uh, the the birth of HQ, we, we now have changed the name to Hope Healing Harmony because we've, like, the roots are always in Harrison neighborhood in North Minneapolis, but it's, it's grown over the past five years um, since we first started. And so it actually started um, five years ago, uh, shortly after the police shooting of Jamar Clark. And um, many of y'all are aware of, of that. And, and that happened right here in our community where, where I live. And we're just, we're just a group of people trying to figure out how to heal together, how to grieve together, how to make sense of um, these really hard experiences, right? And so it was myself and, and a group of other organizers and an artist and leaders in the community just at a table together saying, how can we hold this space um, for others to come in and just, just be free to grieve and f be free to heal, be free to, to laugh and to cry and to do what we need to do to move this energy around, right? And so uh, we were really intentional about holding that space. And so it started off as an open mic and healing circle. And we had uh, people come in who offered free food. There was a, so we're, I'm off of, um, if anybody's familiar with North Minneapolis and the Harrison neighborhood, I'm right off of um, Glenwood and Morgan. And uh, there used to be a little little catering shop across the street from this bike shop. There's Venture North and then uh, Nanny's House of Soul, which actually just moved back over here. But mm -hmm. Nanny's House of Soul came through and, and we were at the bike shop rocking with, with a microphone and a live band. And they said, this is something that's so beautiful and so positive that we want to support. And so they actually gave us free food they brought in their famous soul rolls and like blessed everybody in the building with soul <laughs> rolls. It was scrumptious, right? And, and people were coming through, like they would come through and just, just share on the microphone because there's this idea of like 
you know, the sage on the stage, whoever has the mm -hmm. microphone has all the power, but really as a community holding the ceiling space, we wanted to embody, like, we're just guides alongside, right? We, we, we do have, we come with gifts. We all come with gifts that so we believe in the wisdom of the body. And so um, we wanted to open up that space for anybody, everybody to step to the mic, say what they needed to say, no, no filter, no, no sensor. And, but it was all good vibes. It was all healing. And that's the way it's been for the past. Uh, I, I want to say uh, we did it for four years. And then last year we started doing online stuff. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the summer, we actually did do one outdoor event that was an outdoor healing circle where we were, um, mm. you know, we were distanced and masked and we had, um, uh, uh, Cage Revolutionary Catering came and brought food. But we kind of have some basic pillars where we're always um, an open mic where we open up the mic to anybody, everybody wants to share because it's not just about one person talking. Mm -hmm. And we always have food, uh, free food for anybody, everybody who wants it because living in North Minneapolis, we're in what's called a food desert where we don't have a lot of access to healthy foods. So we always right, want to provide right. that. Um, and then it's just always good, good healing vibes. We're always going to center healing through the art. So those, those kind of like the three main pillars. Um, and yeah, I've been, been honored to hold that space for, for over four years now. And uh, wow. we're, we're still, still rocking, still holding it down. So, and you do this grounding uh, um, ritual before each of the readings. Am I right on that? Um, we don't always do uh, grounding yeah. every at every uh, open mic, but so we do a lot of healing practices. We have a lot of healers come in and do different guiding. And we have, um, we even had like political activists come in and, and help people get engaged, you know, civic, civically engaged in the, in, the, in the voting process. And we, every single HQ, we have someone come in uh -huh. and offer an educational component. Um, so, yeah. But that's all part of the healing process for me. I think we have to keep education, you know, going strong and, and, and increase and even that awareness so that we can show up as our best selves um, with that new knowledge. So, so for, for you yourself um, in your work, mm -hmm. uh, do you find yourself using, are there any of, the, any of the people that you've encountered in the four years of doing HQ that it's like, oh, I'm going to start incorporating that practice into my work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's lots of folks who've come in and they're like, yo, I never experienced anything like this. This type of space where I can be unapologetic. I can bring my, my full self and there, there's not a lot of judgment. And you're all actually talking about healing, like holistic healing. Because sometimes we, we, we bifurcate different parts of healing or we kind of like break it up into different, different pieces. But I think... Um, for me, for me, it's it's very important that it's like mind, body, soul, like all 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 of it is is intertwined, all of it is mm -hmm. interconnected, and so um, just given the space to talk about that, that's gonna look different for different people, for different bodies. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's not about like oh, you have to do it the same way I do it, because I'm gonna learn from the way that you do it, like what's helpful for you. Mm -hmm. I may I may get something from that too, but ultimately, if we're each showing up um, as as healed people that contributes to the collective healing of the world. And so that's yeah. really what I care about is holding that space where we can all share healing practices, all share healing wisdom and work towards a more healed world, so. Yeah, I know like for myself, it's great to hear you talk about how um, looking at that holistically and keeping that all in balance, uh, you know, your, your spiritual self with your physical self, with your emotional self, with your mental self, with your active, with the self that's active in the world and engaging. Um, for me, I found this year to be really de destabilizing <laughs> in that it just became a whole messed up ball of twine that some primordial cat played with too long. Um, I'm wondering about uh, um, Lisa, Paula, or Taylor, um, any of your e experiences, how this year has affected, this year or the last four years, have um, affected uh, your practice, you know, what you do in order to get the space to create. I'm going to pick on Lisa first. Because you're in the corner. 
nobody puts baby in the corner. Um, <laughs> Thank movie references because situationally is the most funny I am and so there aren't any situations anymore there just aren't situations no I mean there are but they're largely not as funny as that one was so thank you um yeah so the question is how how has the last year the last four years affected my creativity and I mean in mind-boggling ways in in growing ways I feel like um in some ways it comes back to the back to the root or back to the ways that um, literature, I feel like literature, writing, reading, creativity, all of that really has helped me hold on in the past when things have been hard personally, or when, um, like you mentioned, collective <sighs> difficulties have been experienced or been really present. Um, they're always present, but you know, sometimes they're more, um, I don't know, they're, they're stronger. They smell stronger than other times, right? Sometimes they hurt more than other times. And um, I feel like there's a resilience and I even don't even love that word, but there is something that comes, nurturing maybe is better. Um, there's a nurturing that comes um, from being able to create and wrestle with something and process through art. I feel like this last year, especially, when we've been um, in many of us um, kind of stuck or contained in different ways um, or maybe some of the same ways that we have been historically, it feels like um, creativity is a way of like kind of escaping um, and, and finding, um, yeah, finding sweetness and softness and, and humor. Um, we have to like, I don't know, for me, I have to like crawl into a story. You know, there's something about, you know, I can read the first 50 pages of a lot of different novels and not really read the rest of them. I don't think I'm the only one that does that. I hope I'm not the only one that does no, that. No, no, I'm, I'm guilty as well. Right? And I'm not <laughs> novelist. Like, I'm not coming at you novelists. You're fabulous. But also sometimes the book doesn't sit right. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes that's not the story I care about. You're like, oh, this is about this. I don't care about siblings right now, right? <laughs> You're like, I want to read a book about a family. Who gives a mess? I want to hear some romance. Like, give me something sultry, right? Like, we have different oh. moods. And so it's hard to find, sometimes it's hard to find kind of what it is that I need. And I feel like that that's kind of like healing. You just don't always know what it is you need. Sometimes you are unsoothable. And I think that the medicine for me this last five years has been like, yeah, sometimes it's not gonna come together in the morning. Sometimes the morning's just as messed up as your dream was. Um, yeah. And yeah, and I, so I'm, I'm thinking, I'm sitting with that a lot. Um, and I feel like it's pushed me to be more routine about um, at least trying to find something there. Because if I'm not, kind of pushing myself to write, um, I'll get kind of, well, I get grumpy. It's like I get idea constipated or something, you know, like the systems mm. are not happy. I do not feel good. This doesn't feel good in my body. It doesn't feel like, um, yeah, I can't move from here, right? Like I can't do anything here. Like that stagnant mm -hmm. funk. It ain't good, honey. And it's not good for my relationships. Like I don't show up the best when I'm feeling that way. Um, so yeah, I feel like that that's really where I've been sitting is like, how do I just keep these muscles from atrophying? Because look, even if it's not pretty, at least it's something. And I'll go on again tomorrow in some- Do you feel like you've had more stuff like um, kind of like bottled up and and inside you be over this year or the last well, few years? I or? mean, I think, gosh, no, like, let me, I'm like, okay, I wasn't going to do this. No, <laughs> that's not how it feels with this talk. Like, we're all just waiting for the time where we share things that we would tell our therapists, but I don't have a therapist. So here we go. <laughs> the people are my therapists. Thank you, 12 people on this call. Um, but I feel like this, uh, this is, because we're inside, because we're, and like I use that, like the inside, there's something that feels cloistered about the moment. Because of that, it has meant like, I can't just escape it in this, uh, I can't escape like, um, 
I can't avoid, I can't bypass, that's the word I need. I can't bypass um, some of my own, um, yeah, some of my own gripes with myself. Like, I can't bypass, like, we are our own worst enemies, but like, mm. I am so annoying. I am so sorry to my partner all the time. I'm like, I, this is just what I'm like today because I don't have anybody else to take it out on, but it's like that internally, right? Like I'm just, I'm, uh, when, when you want to talk to everybody, what's not exuberant, what's the word? Um, uh, loquacious. Well, that's one thing. Yeah. Extroverted, extroverted, extroverted thing. Yeah, yeah. These are things but we need each other, right? We need each other to remember different words sometimes. So that's a good community, example. Village. I, yeah, yeah. We just, the community dictionary, we need to look up a word sometimes. Um, I feel like that. I feel, I feel like I keep tripping over myself. That's what I feel like. And not in all, not in all bad ways. Some of it I'm getting better, I think, but some of it, who knows? I guess we'll find out (laughs) where it's not over yet. So (laughs) I don't have to be done healing yet. That's good. That's great. (laughs) Um, uh, Paula, how, how has this, how have you been dealing with, uh, you know, your practice or, or, you know, what you do to get to your work? Yeah, it's um good question. <laughs> uh, I've thought a lot about that because there are, there are days over the last year, probably over the last four years, right, where my relationship to language is just um, absent, you know, um, I hope that you can hear me okay. My computer is freezing up from my end a little bit. So, Um, Mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. And so uh, similar, uh, Lisa, I'm so glad you said that. I get, I actually get more clumsy if I, if my practice stops, right? Um, Not even, yeah, like cranky and all of that. And they just like accidentally break things. I get, because half of my mind is, making something and the other half is um disrespecting the fact that like i need to be doing i I need to be making something and so um i found that i needed to just find a purpose or a why um that it had to be much less about any kind of product and so sometimes i worked more with images than i usually do as someone who considers myself a writer first um, collage or um, some like maybe some show and tell. There were the worst two weeks of my life this um, past year became I guess a tiny comic book series like I just needed to simplify I think in some way um, and then and then I think also I, I needed to to use my work as a way to connect like I didn't care about publication or, you know, like there's no out to read or anything like that. So it was really more about um, connection. And so it was, uh, I, I wrote poems for people more than I, than I often do. Um, and when I went looking for uh, what I wanted to read, it was similar to that too, where I, I am somebody who will just read some, like I'll watch a movie to the end, I'll read a book to the end historically that I am not interested in because I'm like, well, I made a commitment and, um, <laughs> and I did not do that anymore. Um, so we, like, um, I also don't do that anymore. Um, a mentor of mine who, who passed early last year, Ralph Angel was uh, talking about that once too, that he would read as part of his writing practice. He would read until he found like the spark that he needed, you know? Mm. And then he could put it, put down the book and, and begin his, his day. So I was, thought that was useful. Hmm. So kind of like going back, it sounds like going back to more like uh, ba- reacquainting yourself with basics in a sense. Yeah, just starting anywhere. I think, yeah, I guess so. Yep, yep. Um, just not stopping, like, you know, just continuing to move, even right. if it's not in a, yeah, not being product oriented, just right process, just making a poem or just making something, whatever it is, you know. 
So was there a period of time before that where it was sort of like, I, I've just, the things that I had been doing aren't working and what's, what's my problem kind of situation? Or was it more just, okay, we're just stripping down. <laughs> Came back to the basics. Is that a question for all of us or? No, that's a question for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, nothing was working. I had no connection to language. Um, it, yeah, 2020 was quite a year for, for every single one of us, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and there were some personal loss. Well, we're doing that thing a little bit. Uh, oh, just me, yeah. So there was also a surprise divorce and a, a mother death. And um, yeah, I didn't, have, I didn't have language much of the time, so. And do you feel that you have language kind of back through uh, the stripping down then? Yeah, um, something, yeah, there's some connection, you know? I think I have a reason to um, be of use or for language, yeah, I do, I do. And I, and I don't think it's the same every day for anyone, right? Like grief and healing is not, um, a straight line, right? Or an uphill battle. Mm -hmm. So I think every day, and I don't think I'm alone in this. I think every day is just very different. But because I commit, like they're in April, which is natural, natural poetry month. Natural. Or national poetry. <laughs> uh, I like natural poetry. Um, Let's do that. <laughs> maybe. Both. Yeah, that's maybe. I was saying that my language is always kind of like that. Um, but, you know, people try to write a poem a day, right? And I've actually tried to do that before. And this year I was like, I will write a sentence a day. And sometimes that permitted me to write quite a bit more. But I, there was something very good about setting the bar low this year <laughs> for my practice. Yeah, I should do that. I've never been able to do that poem a day thing. <laughs> um. Islela, uh, Islela, um, how have you been doing uh, throughout this? What is, what, how has this changed your process of creation? Um, first, I have to warn you, my dog is being really loud right now. So if you <laughs> hear um, sudden crashes, that's my dog. Um, sudden crashes? <laughs> He just, he's clumsy. Um, yeah, I think I, I really resonate with what um, Paula shared that, you know, the connection to language has been really hard this last year. A lot of surprises, both on the world level and the personal level, which I think a lot of people can relate to. Um, yeah, in terms of art and healing, the most grounding practice for me has been music. So not as much writing in terms of generating. Uh, I have even reading has slowed down. I've spent 12 months just rereading All About Love by Bell Hooks like over and over and over again. Um, and finally picked up new books again. But um, yeah, music has been the most grounding. Um, I've definitely had that experience of where I'm going back and listening to songs or singing songs that I've known for years or my whole life. And just for the first time, I'm actually listening to the words mm. and I'm just floored. Um, I've been going through a share phase the last few weeks also. Um, but ah. yeah. And also just, I grew up singing these songs and now all of a sudden I'm hearing them for the first time. But um yeah, that's been the most grounding connection I've had to language in the last 10, almost 11, 12 months. Um, and yeah, I either the, the first part of the, the pandemic and the shift to being, I, I have the, the fortune of working from, from home for what my main job. Um, and so the first shit, the first part of that, I was part of a, a cohort of folks writing and we were suddenly trying to figure out how to 
shift to doing this virtually when it was initially intended to be a virtual experience. And um, I was really still grateful for that because it gave me some type of structure and some type of accountability. And so I, I was generating more in that first piece because I had deadlines, I had workshops, I had to read, I wanted to stay connected to um, the material that, that we were working on. So that, but, but then once that ended in June, then I, I lost it, right? The, I do really well with, with structures of accountability um, and having to rely on myself for that <laughs> was not uh, really mm -hmm. reliable. Yeah. The second yep. of the pandemic, but um, yeah, outside of of writing, you know, in, in my bio um, that David shared, I mentioned coming back to making tortillas and and just cooking and reconnecting with practices also that I grew up with and uh, that all, before used to take too much time, right? Before I didn't have the time to do this, it was easier to go to the mercado and pick up some tortillas. And, mm -hmm. and you know, when I'm suddenly forced to only go to the grocery store once a month, those tortillas only last so long, especially in my house. So I had to come back into that practice and, you know, have found it to be really peaceful and really just a moment of pause throughout the day. And yeah, I mean, also, I know a lot of folks have taken on new practices and hobbies throughout this time. I am one of those people that has become obsessed with plants um, oh. and trying well, not- Is that a new thing then? Is that a new thing? It is new because I've, I haven't typically had a green thumb, so. So yeah, I think that that has been just helpful for me about, especially in isolation, especially in the winter here, because you know we're not in California where I'm from, where you can just be outside more in January, right? Um, trying to have some greenery, some nature within four walls has been really meditative. And I try and whenever I'm doing something, I mean, I have plants in every room now, which often means that I forget to water some of them because I'm not. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, that's where I'm at. I, I find that interesting. Again, that sounds like there's a lot of, um, uh, and coming from what you were talking about, Paula, like a stripping down to, you know, a, a essentials, kind of, which I guess maybe is kind of like a grounding. Does that make sense? Like it's more of a, you know, getting back to things that are a bit more tactile and, and essential and through that maybe grounding. Like, like, um, with the plants and making tortillas and such. Uh, it kind of reminds me, um, we had all put together every, we meaning everybody but me, <laughs> uh, had, uh, um, were prepared to talk about, uh, um, you know, brought some uh, works that had in, uh, inspired them and such, and some, uh, and this just reminded me um, of uh, um, uh, Paula. I think what you had were going to share, um, which was a so writer I'm not exactly familiar with, uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, on braiding sweetgrass. Would you like to share yeah. that? Um, sure, I would love to. Um, so this is what uh, I have to admit that I am only I'm late to the game and only halfway through this library book, which means that I have to give it back at some point. So can you renew it? Um, I'm just going to have to get my own copy because it it's a little hard not to be able to even write in it, you know, so. Um, but yeah, she's just been so meaningful to me as I think about, um, I, I'm just gonna 
Um, well, one of the first things I'm not going to read this essay, but one thing she talks about is uh, one essay is like about becoming indigenous and basically that she says a bunch of beautiful things because she always says a bunch of beautiful things, but she says um, like European folk can't become indigenous in any way, but we can be a little more like um, the plantain than could do. And so I just think a lot about like the healing things um, when I could get outside and just getting to know back to that grounding idea. Um, knowing my own land, like knowing my own um, little parcel where I, where I spend all my time and just like getting to know the dandelion, getting to know the plantain and like how I can be the tiniest bit like useful and support people's better health. Um, and part of that is through gratitude, um, which I, uh, there's uh, just a paragraph that I will read where, um, this is from her essay, Allegiance to Gratitude. And it's about the um, Onondaga Thanksgiving address. Um, While expressing gratitude seems innocent enough, it is a revolutionary idea in a consumer society Contentment is a radical proposition. Recognizing abundance rather than scarcity undermines an economy that thrives by creating unmet desires. Gratitude cultivates an ethics of fullness, but the economy needs emptiness. The Thanksgiving address reminds you that you already have everything you need. Gratitude doesn't send you out shopping to find satisfaction. It comes as a gift rather than a commodity subverting the foundation of the whole economy. That's good medicine for land and people alike. Um, that was just the part that I wanted to share by her. Wow. Yeah, I think that really speaks a lot of what we've been talking about. Um, uh, there was a bit of it that reminded me, um, Joe, you had talked when we had talked on our own earlier about uh, um, uh, Dr. Uh, um, Joy Lewis and the orange method. I don't know, I heard something kind of, maybe it was because of referring to um, it as a, a revolution of, of gratitude or how radical that can be that seemed to, um, am I correct in saying that seems to speak to that in, in a bit, what she has talked about? I would definitely say so. Yeah, I think that gratitude is absolutely radical. Um, I, love, I love that quote talking about it being subversive to the entire economy. That's, ah, I love it. That's so great. I really got to read that book. But um, yeah, Dr. Joy, Dr. Joy Lewis, uh, for folks who aren't familiar with her, she's phenomenal powerhouse black woman in the community. She's a healer, community leader, one of my one of my mentors who who's like uh, healing practices that that she that she guides people through have really been impactful for my life and for my my healing journey. Um, and she definitely talks about gratitude uh, a lot, like just being rooted in gratitude and gratitude. One of the things she she told me. Uh, one of her classes was like taking a moment to be perfectly pleased with with who you are and where you are and your body because I think as I think it was Lisa or who was it who said like we're our own biggest critics right right um, we can we can just beat ourselves up at any given moment with this negative self-talk and just find little things we don't like about ourselves but um so much of what uh Dr. Joy has kind of guided me and other students through is like just just that radical acceptance and that radical gratitude of, of who you are, like all the parts of ourselves, um, which is something I have to keep coming back to again and again. That's why I say it's a practice. That's why I talk a lot about practice because I need practices because a lot of things I'm just out of practice <laughs> of doing, I'm out of practice of, of loving myself unconditionally and deeply. I'm out of practice of, of having gratitude, right? And so um, I, I need those reminders right to, to bring me back to ground me and sit to me again and again and again and so yeah dr joy i, I definitely want to shout shout uh, her out and recommend anybody particularly folks in the twin cities i don't want to just assume that everybody here is uh in the twin cities but folks who are, who are in the twin cities 
Um, Dr. Joy is all over the, the Twin Cities and she has books and she she's the founder of the Healing Justice Foundation. I'm going to put her name in the uh, chat yeah. because it's spelled a little differently. J-O-I, Dr. Joy. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you'll be spending a lot of time looking for her and finding other people instead. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, what you're saying, Joe, just reminds me about how, you know, decolonization work or the work of of healing or the healing justice work, right? Of healing ourselves in the present moment isn't about like changing everything about ourselves in one minute, in one, you know, one day. It's not an overnight process. It's really, it is that practice that you're speaking to of, and it's kind of like finding your voice as a, as a writer or maybe a reader even of what your taste is. It's, you have to also kind of go through a trial and error process, you know, of like, of, of what works for you, what works for your body. Um, you know, and what, and, and there's some research involved there too, right, in terms of, um, yeah, just what your, what your, I keep on thinking about voice, like what your voice is, what your connection is to it. Um, there's something that's kind of intuitive and in asking you for different kinds of knowledge than just, um, I don't know, then maybe what's the most obvious what's the most, what's the easiest thing? What's the thing you've always done, right? I think this period has really given us a time to come away from our social interactions that maybe have us interacting this in a certain way with everybody mm -hmm. um, a little bit, right? Like there's, you think about the kinds of transitions you go through, like from middle school to high school or something like that, right? It's like a whole new you or a whole new, right? So there's, I feel like there's something happening right now where, um, we're all being able to reflect on kind of how we show up for ourselves um, and see how that kind of, I guess we'll see, right? Like there's something about when we talk about all this stuff that's happened this last year, we don't have context with ourselves about half the time what day it is. So what does it look like for us to learn about having context about what time it is, right? <laughs> um, um, yeah, I'm thinking about how I think that, I don't know, that that's kind of what brought me to think about, I'll share a little bit about the Black arts movement and about how, um, and about coming into literature, coming into yourself through literature, right? So I'm an adoptee and I come to African-American literature as a child of the diaspora, but as a person who has cultivated creative relationships or what I call creative kinships um, with uh, writers and thinkers across time and space. And that to me has been family. That to me has been auntie and uncle and, 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 and my gender queer, you know, siblings and, and forebears, like telling me who I am, telling, reminding me who I am and, and inspiring me to think differently. Um, and so I'm thinking about how in our, our little silos, we were siloed earlier, right? Before when we were in public, we were siloed then, yes. Um, but now in this moment, we're in a, we've had a deep study session um, with us and all our funk and all of our, all of our people's funk, right? Like I think about Clubhouse, the app and how folks are like Clubhouse and then other folks are like Clubhouse, like the wildness that's happening there, the wildness that's happening in terms of, well, I mean, come on, whiteness, we have to talk about it. There's a lot happening there and there's a lot of fear there of being miscategorized as one of those kinds of white people. And isn't that an interesting flip to, for us to switch? Um, because for so long we've been worried about different kinds of exceptionalism. Um, but I'm thinking about Baraka and I'm thinking about um, specifically mm -hmm. in Agony is Now. Um, and I have this book. I love this book. I love anthologies. So if you have a hard time. Yeah, I was looking into that. That is really great. I'm obsessed with anthologies. I am a anthology stan. Like anytime I like, come on, are you kidding me? This book has gene tumor up in here, Langston Hughes County Cullen, just just all kicking it in the same section. Oh, and it was edited by June Jordan, right? Yes. <laughs> Who do I want to tell me what to read? June Mother Grabbing Jordan for crying out loud. <laughs> but in Agony is now I love because first of all, this first line, I am inside someone who hates me. And so I know I talked about the psychological aspects, the torment that I feel like I've been experiencing. But I think as an adoptee, I pick up this book, I'm reading, I am inside somebody who hates me. I look out from his eyes, smell what foul tunes come into his breath, love his wretched women. The disassociation in here is so flipping palpable. 
And if we don't experience that at some point in our lives, we're lucky. I don't care what you look like. I don't care how you identify. I think we're very lucky if we don't experience that. But the line that will sing for me still is this is the enclosure. And every now and then I have a haunting from this poem that just thinks just the word enclosure is like emblazoned upon my forehead. But I think about Baraka and and I think about how I first came to understanding my blackness through some of the things that Baraka was able to understand and articulate about his own blackness. And we're talking across years and years. But right. then I think about how messed the up it is that I didn't find out about Adrian Kennedy until 10 years after I found out about Baraka and both of those motherfuckers, I excuse my French, but both of those motherfuckers, they're amazingly talented artists. Baraka is a homophobe and a little bit anti-Semitic, but the, in terms of Kennedy, Kennedy's a mixed person writing in the same time period, right? Run a, won an Obie award the same year for, uh, that the Dutchman did for um, the funny house of a Negro. And here, the funny house of the Negro is Sarah, a Negro, having six different people that live inside her and all these different voices that come out and is in her room, right? And is in an enclosure and trapped in the space and tripping all over herself. So I'm just <laughs> interested in the ways that, you know, we're maybe, we're experiencing, we, our writing will be beautiful when we're able to find the language around it. We don't have to know it today. We'll find it later. Maybe we'll find it later. Oh, Thank you I for coming it. to my TED talk. I wanted to say that about those people <laughs> and how messed up it is. That is a great line. Um, I'm going to have to remember that. Uh, our, um, what was it? Our, our art will be good if we find the language for it or our words. Now I'm totally forgetting what you said. The words will come later. It's fine. Yeah. We don't have executive faculty. We're all trigger triggered right now. This is so messy. This ain't right. It ain't right. <laughs> like it's not clear. It's not. I don't know. Those are. My, I have opinions that are strong now. <laughs> so I asked you. <laughs> so do you feel kind of like you're you're that that person you know in with six voices in your head that are just in this room that you can't get out of? Oh, I think you're on mute. Well, I say yes, but I think Joe has something to say about it. Joe, oh, sorry. Or are you just leaning in? Oh, I was leaning in and affirming. That was like all love and affirmation. That's all that was. And I think I was also reading, I had just clicked on the chat too to read what folks were ah, saying. Nice. Yeah, that's all it was. Yeah, keep going. You're amazing. Well, I mean, I think, okay, so this is, okay, this is a line from this play, right? We're in Sarah's bedroom. Okay. Sarah is the Duchess. Sarah is, Sarah is all these things. Sarah is the Duchess. Sarah is Queen Victoria. Sarah is Jesus. Sarah is Patrice Lumumba. Sarah is Sarah's landlady too, right? Like there's all this layers, these layers, <laughs> these layers. These layers, these layers. And right, like, I'm not mad at that. I'm like, I get that, you know? Some people say, might be like, I'm not sure exactly, but that's the whole, that plays are weird. Like, come on, that's not the weirdest thing that's ever happened on stage. Anyways, these, the rooms are my rooms. A Habsburg chamber, a chamber in a Victorian castle, the hotel where I killed my father, the jungle. These are the places my cells exist in. I know no places, that is, I cannot believe in places. To believe in places is to know hope. And to know the emotion of hope is to know beauty. It links us across a horizon and connects us to the world. And I think about, and then there's, right, then there's Baraka who is in an agony is now, talks about beauty. You will, lost soul, say beauty. I think there's something in there about, you know, the words will come. That's the medicine to me. The words will come. It's okay. The words will come. You know, the, the funny thing is, is mentioning that about those multiple voices. I almost had that feeling in reading uh, um, that particular Baraka poem um, uh, earlier today or yesterday that it, it kind of felt like that sort of thing that there's so many different voices you know, yelling to, to get out from in that poem, that there's just so many different voices, it seemed to me, going on. So, no, oh, thank you very much. Um, 
Hey, Thela, uh, you had um, you had an interesting one picked out, uh, and then uh, from who is the actually you had two, so I'm I'm not gonna <laughs> gonna I'm not gonna try to throw you which one to read, but one of them was from the secretary the the now secretary of the interior. Yeah, so I. <laughs> Um, I think like most people, I was also indecisive about what to share because I was going through books the other day and I'm like highlighting a million passages and thinking there's no way I can pick. So I gave myself two choices. Um, but one is from a book um, called Sister Nations, N Native Women Writers on Community, um, edited by our uh, local Hyder Grick. Um, and um, yeah, Minnesota. Um, and so it, uh, in the vein with Lisa, it is also an anthology because I also find myself constantly coming back to anthologies um, because there's just so much. One, I have a short attention span. Two, it's just rich in so many ways that I don't get with a novel, but that's also my, my literary inclination. But um, it was published years ago. When exactly, I don't know. I guess I could look that up. 2002. So I guess not too long ago, but uh, I was flipping through it and I came back upon an essay uh, written by Deborah Holland, who now we know as Deb Holland, who uh, is a representative. Uh, she's a Laguna Pueblo and she was recently named and nominated as the Secretary of the Interior, um, which is the first um, indigenous person in that role. Um, and so she has an essay in here uh, on mother's love and one of the things that I have found myself just coming back to is, is how do we define love and how do we, what is our relationship with loving, like Joe shared, loving ourselves um, and our other relationships. What does that mean? What does it look like? What do the actions look like, right? It's um, to draw on bell hooks. It's, um, it's a verb, right? It's an action, not just a feeling and, and really trying to claim that and feel that also in relationship uh, just to myself because of the the shift where we're not seeing as many people as we used to, right? And even though I shared about doing music, now doing music is often me just serenading my dog um, as opposed to being in community with some of my friends who will play the guitar and also sing. And um, so trying to redefine what that means on a personal, very intimate level. And uh, in that essay, she talks... Um, specifically about corn, and she's also from the Southwest. So um, I'll just read this, this little section. Sometimes the corn was still moist when we got it home. So mom would lay it on a white sheet on top of our house until it dried. I'd help her grind some of it into cornmeal and the rest she made into hominy by boiling the loose kernels with ashes. By rinsing them afterwards, the outside shell came off and then mom dried them again. I loved the smell of hominy simmering on a hot stove. It steamed up the windows and I could even smell it from outside. My mother's cooking was so dear to me. When she cooked, she never just cooked. The food I ate while growing up was for nourishing my body and my spirit. Uh, for me, this excerpt was just very peaceful and very almost, mm, almost biblical in a sense, just because of, as someone who grew up with corn and not only corn on the cob, you know, I grew up eating pozole, I grew up eating tortillas and making tortillas, but then lost that practice and, and reclaimed it this past year. But the way she talks about the process of making it moist and then drying it and then doing it over and over again. And sometimes these processes, some of the steps have to happen multiple times. And sometimes we think that that is going back and having to, you know, we've, we've digressed, we've gone back to square one, but sometimes that really is just part of how we make our food and how we nourish ourselves. And I mean, the, the time it takes from, uh, an ear of corn to end up in my pozole or end up in the tortillas that I'm making and the number of hands uh, and hearts that have touched that corn 
is you know infinite, right? I will never know unless I start growing my own corn, which I had enough trouble with tomatoes this last year, so I don't know how likely that is, but I will never know how many hands and hearts actually touch the food that I am eating and that is nourishing my body. And so it's just important for me to just remember that there's so many prayers and well wishes in that food on its journey to, to nourishing me. Um, yeah. I thought that's, you know, it seems like just to bring it all kind of this part of our discussion, all 360, um, you know, I, I just am struck with how much not only are we talking about grounding with getting back to stripping away things, getting back to basics with our, ourselves, but also, again, um, like that process of making uh, tortillas and then the whole uh, uh, thing of remembering the smell of hominy and stuff, going back to where we started with the grounding, with, you know, um, about grounding ourselves, uh, communing with uh, our ancestors. I mean, that's seems to me exactly what that what that uh, selection from Deb Holland was was talking about um, through the metaphor, the action of making food. So I just find that kind of fantastic. Um, and maybe at that point, we're going to take a, uh, a brief break for I don't know what time we have here, maybe a, a couple minutes um, and come back and do some do some reading. Uh, what I'm going to do is get myself some water. I advise everybody to stand up or stretch or whatever. And then I'm going to probably talk for a bit about um, what the organization is that is putting this on, um, Grilla Ratura. So I'll be right back. Okay. 